Who was up at five o'clock this morning? How many of you went outside and saw what was going on? Yeah. Anybody? Six o'clock. You guys were all inside at five in the morning? You missed the beauty of what was happening? Well, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to tell you. Five o'clock in the morning. You know, we're living in the days when we have the longest amount of light for all year. Isn't that amazing? Five o'clock in the morning, it's not dark anymore. Ooh, there was something that happened that was beautiful. It's like, oh, you should have seen it. But that's okay. I'll let you figure it out. The Bible says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. And their expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day by day pours forth speech. And night by night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their expanse to the end of it. In them he has placed a tent for the sun. It's rising. It's from one end of the heavens, a circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Can you relate to that part, huh? There is nothing hidden from its seat. It's amazing. Everywhere you look, everywhere around, I don't care if it's 5 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock in the afternoon or in the morning, 1 o'clock, God's fingerprint is everywhere. Amen. Wherever you look. We have this umbrella on our deck where these birds come back every year and they look for this umbrella to make their nest in. It's like, it's got to be the same birds. Every year, they wait for this umbrella. And they make their little nest. And mom is up there now, okay, sitting on her nest. It's kind of funny. Mom flies away. We were sitting on the deck having dinner. Mom flies away. We go, oh, she flew away for a little break. Next thing you know, we hear her squawking, squawk, squawk. You know why? She wants us to get out of there so she can get back to her nest. So we leave, we go in the house for just a couple minutes, guess what she does? Comes back to her nest, we come back, sit down, there she is. It's amazing to watch God work in all the things he's created. Even when you watch how birds work, how detailed they are. The Bible says that a sparrow doesn't even fall from the ground that God doesn't know. God knows everything. His sovereignty rules over all. Now, I don't know what's gone on in your life over this last seven days. I don't know if you would go, it's good. Or if you go, yeah, it's average. Or if you go, no, nah, it wasn't good. It doesn't matter. Whatever's gone on in your life, realize this. If you are a child of the king, God's got you in his hands. Bible says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me and no one shall snatch them. Out of my hands. My father, who is greater than me, has given them to me, and no one shall snatch them out of my father's hands. You know, if you're here today and you love Jesus, he's your savior and redeemer, guess where you're sitting? Woo! Right in the hands of the great I am. You don't have to worry. You go, oh no, what's happening in the world around us? What's going to Guess what? Relax. Who's got you? God, the great I am, you can take a deep breath. Don't panic. You are exactly where you need to be. And you, if you are a child of the king, you have a shepherd, a great shepherd, Jesus, who is watching you, who is making sure that you are right where you need to be. You have a purpose in life. Do you realize that? You have a purpose. Your purpose is to honor and glorify God. Your purpose is to be a good husband. Take care of your wife. Your purpose as a wife is to be a good wife. Take care of your husband. Your purpose is to be a good family. Take care of your children. Your purpose is to be light and salt so people know that there's hope in Jesus. Your purpose is to glorify God. And you can walk through like, you know, I heard this week there are so many people living in the world that have no purpose. They, they have no reason to live. They can't get a job. They go, I mean... All the jobs are taken care of. All the study they did, they can't get a job from their college degrees because all the jobs are taken either by somebody else or by, by some automated machine. They don't have any purpose anymore. They can't find a job. So they're aimlessly wandering about. 
And they said, one of the reasons why people are doing some of the stupid things they do, they're pushing down monuments, they're painting on store windows, they're throwing paint on certain paintings that are important. You know why they do that? Because they're looking for purpose. And they go, at least I can do something that has impacted something somewhere. That's the, the craziness of what's going on in the world. So I want you to know, you holding your hand, the answer. You have the penicillin. That's Jesus. You, as Christ followers, can help people know that they can have purpose. Because when you are a child of the King, you have purpose. You can glorify God. You can live life. It doesn't matter what's going on. You can give Him the praise and glory. You're light and salt. You share the gospel. That is so important. So take a deep breath. You are important and valuable to God. Remember that. You're a child of the King. You're a sheep of the shepherd. And you don't have to worry. Do not fear. For I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you. For I am your God. Surely I will help you. Surely I will strengthen you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do you know who said that? Yahweh. Yes. Yahweh. The great I am. So, glad you're here. Be encouraged. Last time we were together, we were in the book of Acts. And when we were in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas had just gone into the city of Antioch of Bethesda. They had gone to the local synagogue. Paul was preaching. And boy, was he preaching, man. He was putting things on the table. He was letting everybody know that there is hope in Jesus, that Jesus is the reason that there can be hope in their life, that Jesus is the culmination of history, that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. He was making that clear, and all the Jewish people are listening. And Paul says, I want you all to know why you should believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And he pointed to the Old Testament scriptures. And he said, because in the Old Testament that you read every Sabbath, Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy. He has fulfilled that prophecy. He said, in fact, there's a prophecy there that says there's going to be a forerunner that's going to come before Jesus, who's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And many of you sitting in this room, he said, know who that is or was. It was John the Baptist. You even knew him. In fact, you went down to the Jordan River and watched him baptize all these people. He was the forerunner. He was preaching. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Prepare the way. All these people were getting baptized and you were going, how come all these people are down there and this guy John dunking them in the water? Because they were repenting of their sins and they were preparing their hearts for the Messiah. And then remember when John saw Jesus, what did he say? There he is, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Paul is preaching, baby. He has got the information out. People are listening. But he's not done. Because there's something very important that Paul has to put on the table in order for people to understand this reality of salvation very clearly. So today, we're going to find out what that is. So do you have your Bibles? Hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the Word of God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I love the Word of God. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your Word. There's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We are your children, children of the King. We are your sheep. But we know, and you know, that sheep can be wanderers. That's why we need a shepherd. Because it's easy to wander away from the flock and get out there where some wolf can eat you up. We don't want to be there. So we want to stay close. And staying close means we want to listen to your word. We want to eat your word. We want to digest your word. And so today, Holy Spirit, teach us. Take us farther. Take us deeper. Keep us awake. 
because it's so easy to fall asleep in church. You get nice and comfy and cool, and the next thing you know, you're off in Never Never Land. So, Holy Spirit, keep us alert. Help us to be sharp. May everybody forget my words, but may they remember the word of the Lord. We pray this in your powerful name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to open up to the book of Acts. Again, if you're unfamiliar with navigating in a Bible, there's a table of contents in the beginning. Find that table of contents. Find Old Testament, New Testament. Find the New Testament, and then you go, oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. That's where we are. Find that page. You turn there, and then you go, we're at chapter 13. The big numbers are the chapters. The little numbers are the verses. So we are in chapter 13, and we are going to be picking up today in verse 38. Verse 38 of chapter 13. Again, Paul is preaching. He's in the synagogue. Got a bunch of Jewish people listening to him. He's putting the truth on the table. But he's got to make something very clear. And listen to what he says that is going to be made very clear. Verse 38. He says, Therefore, and again, whenever you see the word therefore, that should tell you what? Look back to what was just said. Why is it therefore? So he says, therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through him, who's him? Jesus. Through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Take heed, therefore, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish. For I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should declare it to you. And as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that those things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, listen to this, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. Woo! There's some good stuff going on here. We're going to unpack it this morning. We're going to start with this simple reality. Jesus, Paul says, is not only the culmination of history. Jesus is not only the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is not only God in the flesh proven by his resurrection, but he says something very important. Know this, Jesus is the justifier of all sinners. The justifier of all sinners. Let it be known to you that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. That's huge because I want you to know this. Every Jew that was sitting in that room today was very much aware of the law and the prophets. How come? Why? Because they were read to them on a regular basis every Sabbath. They heard the law and the prophets. They knew those important truths. In fact, these Jewish people had grown up since they were children learning about the law and the prophets since they were very young. In fact, all Jewish people knew these three realities. Number one, God had a plan for Israel. They knew that. They were taught that since they were little. Number two, God 
promised a Messiah. They knew that. They were taught that from when they were little. And number three, that God had made a provision for sin for the nation of Israel so that they could live in the presence of a holy God. They knew those three things. They were taught them since they were children. So Paul, as he's preaching to all these people in the synagogue, he covered the first two very clearly. But he knows he's got to go a little bit farther because he wants all of these Jewish people to be aware of the simple reality, which they kind of knew, that God made a provision for sin. God made a provision for sin. Three important realities that these Jewish people knew. Now, Jewish people understood the concept of sin. You know why? Who thinks they know why? Okay, we've got one person that thinks they know why. They, a couple people. The Jewish people understood the concept of sin because they were made aware from the minute they could barely walk of the story of Moses. Moses had got up on Mount Sinai. God had given Moses the ten, what? Commandments. Ten commandments. And these ten commandments were designed to be given to the nation of Israel to make them aware of what? Sin. sin. That they were sinners. From the time these Jewish people were children, they had heard that. That had been passed down from century to century. So they were very aware that there was something called sin. Something called sin. They also knew, and they were taught this, that God had given them a provision so that they as sinners could live in the presence of a holy God. And he had given them what was called the sacrificial system. If you know what the sacrificial system is that God gave to the nation of Israel, raise your hand for me. I want to just get a good idea. What is the sacrificial system? Raise your hand if you think you know. Okay, good. We have how many people are looking at me going, I have no idea. Okay. Some of you are either looking at me like, oh, you're still kind of waking up because you're kind of uh, whew, still early in the morning. The sacrificial system. All Jewish children knew about this reality of what the sacrificial system was. In fact, I'm going to give you a little peek. Take your Bibles. Turn to the book of Leviticus. Again, you need to use your index in your Bible. Feel free to do that. Old Testament, New Testament. You get to the Old Testament, you go Genesis, Exodus. What's the next one? Leviticus. Leviticus. Good job, Bible students. Leviticus chapter 5. I'm going to give you a little peek into what these children, these adults knew that they were taught since they were young that had to do with sin. Leviticus chapter 5. We're going to read verses 5 and 6. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, say please wait for me. Wait for me. Okay. We have plenty of patience. We want you to have I'm your here. Bible. She's ready to go. Never be embarrassed to say please wait for me because we want you to be right with us. Here we go. Leviticus chapter 5. I want you to listen to these two verses. A little peek into the sacrificial system. It says, So it shall be when he becomes guilty of one of these. He is one of the people of Israel. When he becomes guilty of one of these, what do you think that is? Sin. Sin. What is he guilty of? One of these. What are these? The Ten Commandments. When he's guilty of one of these, when he's broken one of these, perfect, then he shall confess that in which he has sinned. So the first thing God says is when you break one of these commandments, one of these laws, what's the first thing you need to do? Confess. Confess it. You need to own it. You can't go, well, really wasn't my fault. 
It was my wife's fault. She's the one that did it. She got me mad and she made me do it. Is that confessing your sin? Yeah. No. no. Yeah. The first thing you had to do is you need to own it, the Bible says. You need to confess your sin, what you did, what was wrong. Now, there's a number of things that could be wrong. Bible says, Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God, thy name in vain. Mm -hmm. um, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, and on and on it goes. There's a number of things that a person could do. So God says, here's the system. I'm going to give you this system. When you break one of my laws, first thing you do is what? Yes. Confession. Yes. You've got to own it. Then listen. He shall also bring his guilt offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed. A female from the flock, a lamb or a goat as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin. Simply, the reality of life was that these Jewish people understood that when they sinned, when they broke one of God's commandments, ah, they knew it. There's the commandments. First thing they do, I did it. I own it. I lied. I steal. I used God's name in vain. I committed adultery. I coveted whatever it was. I did it. The second thing they had to do was to take a sacrifice, take it to the priest, who then would take that sacrifice, slay that lamb or that goat, cut its throat. Blood would then be shed. That blood was a covering for the sin that the person committed. When that was taken care of, then the person who committed that sin could have their relationship with God restored. And they could then leave and go about their business. That was the sacrificial system. So now if anybody asks you, hey, do you know what the sacrificial system is that God gave to the children of Israel? You go, yeah. Person sins, they gotta confess their sins. Second, what they do is they take a lamb and go, take it to the priest, sacrifice, blood is shed, and that blood covers their sin, and then they can have their relationship with God restored. That's how the system worked so that the people who were sinners could have a relationship with the Holy God. So, as Paul is preaching to all of these Jewish people, they were pretty well understanding of that. They knew that without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness. But they also knew this, that that was only a temporary solution. Soak that in for a minute. When something is temporary, what does that mean? Doesn't last. Doesn't last. Okay? Doesn't last. It's not going to be there for a long time. This was a temporary solution. And here's why it was temporary. Because the next day, chances are this would happen. The person would what? Sin, Sin again. Uh-oh, they sinned again. Now their relationship with God is broken, so God's law said the first thing they had to do was what? Yes. Confess their sin. The second thing they had to do was what? Sacrifice. They could sacrifice. Blood had to be shed. When that blood was shed, then guess what would happen? Their relationship with God would be good. They could go about their business until? Sin again. Oh, my goodness. They must have a lot of animals. Oh. They... The Jewish people knew about sin. They knew about the shedding of blood. They knew about the sacrificial system. It was ingrained in them because ever since they were young, they watched mom and dad take a sheep or a goat. And say, they watched aunts and uncles. Then when they got a little bit older, they'd have to take their own to the priest. It was like this was a part of their life over and over and over again. So God provided a way for sinful people to have their sin dealt with so that they could live in the presence of a holy God, but it was only a what kind of a solution? Temporary. Temporary solution. 
Every person sitting in that room knew that God had also promised a deliverer. Amen. Uh, Amen. There's coming a deliverer. The Old Testament prophesied that. The Messiah who is going to come, who is going to be the deliverer, who is going to take care of sin once and for all. So all these people listening, they're going, they knew, man, I'm probably going to have to leave the temple today and go offer sacrifice because I was thinking this about her or thinking that about him or I was, you know, wanting her camel and wanting his cloak or whatever. So, oh, got to do it again. They knew because that was part of life, right? Okay, so they knew that there was promised a Messiah who would come and stop this cycle, stop this sacrificial system. So they were yearning for that, yearning for the Messiah. They knew about sin. So let's push the pause button for a minute. Soak that all in. You got that in, Amanda? You soaking it all in? Good. Just want to make sure she's... What a nice smile, kids. Okay? Soak that in. You got it, Liz? Got that soaked in? Dakota, got that? Dakota's soaking it in back there. Okay, soak it in. That's the sacrificial system. That's what people were aware of. That's not the same in the world that we live in today. No. People in the world that we live in today are really not too aware of this reality called sin. They're not. We live in a world today that says, yuck, get that out of here. Get all those old antiquated rules, those old Ten Commandments, get them out of here. We don't want them in our house. We don't want them in our school. We don't want them in our courts. No way. That's all old, antiquated. You got to do this. You got to do that. You can't go there. That is terrible. Get it out. In fact, we need it out of here because that'll free people up. The more people can get rid of that idea of sin, the more they're going to be free. In fact, the counsel today for all people is this. Lean in to your desire. Lean in to who you are. You know all those things on the inside that you feel? Let them out. Because when you let them out, you're going to be free. Free. You're going to experience this freedom before. Because all these old things, the Ten Commandments, all these things, they kept you all bottled up on the inside. So lean into that. Lean into what you feel. And let it out. And when you do, you're going to be free. And culture is going to be free. Because we've got all these people just doing what they really want to do. And that makes us free. And look how nice that is around us, huh? That just makes everything so nice and free. Free sex? Hey, nice and free. Free open marriage? That's great. Free love? Hey, feel free to change your gender if you want. Just lean into that. Just feel free. Feel free to identify as a woman if you're a man. Put on some high heels, wear a dress. Feel free. That's what you feel like. Feel free to lean into that. If you're a woman and you want to be a man, feel free to lean into that. Put on some boots. Come on. Let all your hair grow on your face. Lean into it, because it'll make you free, right? That's what our society says. Hey, if you want to identify as a fox, a cat, a dog, you can do that. You know that in Amador County, in the high school, in Amador High School, there are litter boxes in the restrooms because there are children, high schoolers, that are identifying as animals and they are using the litter boxes in the restrooms yes. rather than the toilets. No way. Yes way. You know why? Because we got to get rid of this thing called sin. Everybody needs to lean in to who they really I mean, hey, if you want to take hormone blockers, go ahead. 
If you want to mutilate your body so that you can look like the opposite sex, go ahead! And don't you dare point your finger at me and tell me that that's sin. That's the world we live in. That's the world we live in. Woo! Completely different world. See, the world that Paul was living in, preaching to the Jewish people, they knew what sin was. And they knew that they were sinners. Because all the time, guess where they were going? To the temple. Because guess what? Oh, I did it again. Oh, man, I'm running out of lambs. What am I going to do? I mean, it's like, whoo, that's offer a lamb, a goat. If they ran on that, they'd get a little turtle dove. And it's like, because they were always having to have some kind of sacrifice to cover up their sin. Now, Paul gets to the best of his message. And you just heard it. I'm going to read it to you again. Listen to what he says. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, sisters, that through him, Jesus, forgiveness of sin, sins, is proclaimed to who? To you, you can have your sins forgiven. You can be freed. Freed. Can you, isn't that so nice to be free? Hey, we had some good friends over for dinner last night. They just bought a house. We said, what do you like about that? What do you like about having your own house? They said, you know, we're free to do whatever we want. If we want to plant something, we can plant it. If we want to cut something down, we can cut it down. If we want to paint something, we can paint it. We don't gotta go, hey, can we do this? We're free. Isn't that nice to be free? You're free. Paul says, all of you that are sitting there going, man, we got this sacrificial system, we got to do it all the time. I'm proclaiming to you that you all can be free. Free. Through Jesus. Because Jesus is the forgiver of sins. Of sins. Amen. Soak that in for just a minute. Because Jesus is the forgiver of sins from all things from which you could not be free through the law of Moses. The law of Moses did not give you any freedom, did it? The law of Moses caused you to be in bondage because it made you aware of your sin. And it's like, oh my goodness, I keep sinning. I wish I would quit. Oh, I got to get another offering. Oh, I got to throw the priest again. Uh, the law of Moses did not free you. Paul says, I got great news for you, Lorraine. You can be free. I got great, great news for you, Liberty. You can be free. Got great news for you, Tom. You can be free. Great. You can be free. You can be free through Jesus because Jesus is the forgiver of sins. This is huge. I mean, you might go, yeah, I've heard that before. What did you do, Jesus? Forgive? Man, to these Jewish people, it was like, wow, you mean that I can quit this sacrificial system thing? You mean that I don't have to keep doing this over and over? Because you see, the sacrificial system covered the sins, didn't it? Until the next time, then what would happen? Cover the sins. Jesus is the forgiver of sins. In other words, your sins are forgotten. Past sins, present sins, and even what? Future sins. How can that be? How can that be that even what I haven't done, because who knows, maybe tomorrow I might get mad at my dog. Hopefully I won't, because Ranger's a great dog. But if I got mad at my dog and I kicked him, that would not be good. That would be a sin. You know that God has forgiven my sins even in my future? How do I know that? Look back. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says he shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. I haven't even been born yet, have I? You haven't been born yet. And you realize that your sins, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, were paid for at the cross? That's awesome. And Paul is announcing that to all these Jewish people. Your sins can 
be forgiven and just imagine what that would feel like. You might know because you love Jesus, huh? Your sins, though they were scarlet, the Bible says, through the blood of Jesus, now they look like white as snow. That's awesome, huh? That's awesome. That's the good news that Paul is preaching. But I want you to listen to what he says next. Listen to what he says. He says, you guys got it? That's the good news. Look at verse 40. Take heed, therefore. If someone were to say to you, take heed, that's like old in English, but how would you translate that today? Take heed. Be careful. Be aware. Beware of the dog. Take heed of the dog, right? Take heed, therefore. Be aware. So that the thing spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Wow, all of, there's this great news. Jesus, forgiveness of sins. And then he says, I don't, you can't miss this. This is too important. Take heed. Because what could happen to you? I don't want it because the prophet said, they said, don't let this happen to you. What did they say? Listen. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and what? Perish. Perish. Paul says, I don't want, I don't want this to happen to you. I don't want you to perish. I want you to grab hold of this truth. You see, there's a lot of people that were listening to Paul going. Yeah, we know that God has a plan for Israel. We know that God provide, is going to plan a, provide a Messiah. We know that God has provided for sin. And Paul says, the answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. And they all go, no, it's not. No, it's not. Jesus was just a man. We know his mom and dad. Jesus was just a man. Do you know anybody that thinks like that today? I talked to a guy this week. I said, man, I i got to ask you some questions. I said, we've talked about this, we've talked about this, and we've talked about this. But I never have asked you about your spiritual life. I want to ask you, what do you think about Jesus? Who do you think he is? Simple answer. Jesus is just a man. Yeah, he's just a man. He taught some good things. He taught people how to love and be nice and everything. He got in trouble with the government and ended up being killed. But he was just a man. Paul says, beware! Take heed! Because if that's who you think Jesus is, you will perish. Perish. You will spend eternity in hell separated from God. So grab this. Take hold of this. That's huge, isn't it? I don't know where you are in your life. If you're sitting here today and you're going, yeah, I came to church because my girlfriend wanted me to come. I'm here at church today because my wife said, we should probably start going to church. You're like, okay, I'll go. If you're here at church today because you go, yeah, we haven't been here for months. Maybe we should kind of show up. Let everybody know we're still alive. If you're at church today because you come every Sunday and you go, see how good I am? I'm at church every Sunday. Okay. Here's what you have to know. Church does not get you to heaven. Amen. Got that? So that Church does not get you to heaven. Jesus gets you to heaven. That's, in, that's vital. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ gets you to heaven. I don't care if you come to church every Sunday of every year or if you come on Easter and Christmas or you come once a year. It doesn't matter. Because church isn't the answer to Who's the answer? Jesus. Jesus. But and I'm going to put a little asterisk here. But church is important. Yes. Kind of like the person who says, I'm going to get in shape. Because that's important. And they go to the gym twice a year. <laughs> After they eat their big Thanksgiving meal, oh, I probably should get to the gym. I told myself to get in shape. And then maybe once in the springtime after the big barbecue. Is that going to Wait a minute. The gym is designed 
to help you stay in shape in the long haul, isn't it? Church is designed to help you stay spiritually strong in the long haul. So that's important. But church doesn't get you to heaven. Jesus gets you to heaven. Church helps you stay buff, strong. Draw to the Lord the strength of his might, right? That's the key. So as Paul is speaking to this, he puts one very important thing on the table. Don't miss it, guys. Because if you do, he says you're going to end up in hell. That's a message we need to remember to tell people. I told my friend, you told me Jesus is the answer. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Let's say you die and you realize that you're going to stand before God. He goes, well, I've been a good man. I've been good. I go, let me ask you a question. Simply this. You ever lied? You go, yeah, I've done that. Has he ever cheated? Yeah, he said, I've done that a few times too. I said, you ever looked at a woman lust after? And yeah, the Bible says that's adultery. I says, well, you're a honking, lying, cheating adulterer. Are you going to stand before God and say, let me in heaven? He goes, well, yeah, well, huh? That's why we need Jesus. So Paul put that on the table. We're going to close it up with this. As Paul and Barnabas, verse 42, were going out, the people pe- kept begging these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God for proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. Do you know why that city blew up and they wanted to hear the word of God? Because they had finally tasted of living water. They had finally tasted of living water. They had been drinking from an empty cistern. And now they said, oh, this is good. We want more. Give us more. And the next Sabbath, it'd be like if we were sitting in church. And the next Sabbath, the next Sunday, The church was full. The parking lot was full. The line out in Highway 88, there were people down there. People are hawking. There's such a traffic jam because everybody in Jackson wants to come and hear about Jesus. Woo, wouldn't that be awesome? That's what happened in Antioch because Paul was preaching Jesus. Awesome. Now, most of us in this room go, I know Jesus. He's my Savior. He's my Redeemer. Some of you, though, I don't know. I I don't know what's going on in your heart. I don't want anybody in this room to not be presented with the opportunity to put their faith and trust in Jesus. If you're here today and you go, I'm a good person, like my friend I talked to, Ah, Jesus, just a man. I want you to understand this. Without Jesus, there's no hope. Without Jesus, there's no forgiveness. He is living water. Today, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you got to do this. you got to do it. Now is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Just like God said to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, confess you're a sinner. Confess, it's yours. Don't blame your wife. Don't blame your husband. Don't blame your dog. Don't blame Gavin Newsom, and don't blame the Democrats. Don't blame Donald Trump. Don't blame anybody. You did it. Own it. Confess your sin. Second thing, believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood so that your sin can be forgiven and forgotten. No more sacrifices. You can say, Please forgive me, Jesus. I'm going to accept your sacrifice of blood that was on the cross. And then thirdly, you say, Jesus, I give you my life. I bow my knee to you. I give my life to you unconditionally. If you've never done that, that is the most important decision you can make. If God's talking to your heart right now and you go, wow, something's going on. You feel this like, like God's knocking on the door of your heart. Maybe today's the day you need to bow your knee to Jesus. Maybe you've been religious. Maybe you've been good. Maybe you've been a nice man, a nice woman. I don't know. That doesn't get you to heaven. 
Because just like my friend, who thought he was pretty good, lying, cheating, adulterer, chances are you're right in that same boat, just like I am in that same boat. Before I came to know Jesus, lying, cheat, covenant, gambling, pornography, addicted, that's me. And guess what? Jesus forgave me of my sin, put me on a new route, got me headed in the other direction. Thank you, Jesus, huh? Woo! Because without Jesus, I'm going to perish. The same is true for all of us in this room. Without Jesus. So, everybody, let's close our eyes, bow our heads. I'm going to just have you think about this real quick. Look into your own life, your own inner kingdom. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your friend. Don't look at anybody. Just look at your own life for just a minute and answer this simple question. Have you bowed your knee to Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you confessed your sin? Said, you know what, Jesus? I need your blood to be applied to my life. I'm going to bow my knee to you and give you my life. Have you done that? Because that is the most important decision in your life. If you haven't, and you sense God knocking on the door of your heart right now, right where you sit, you just tell God this in your own words. God, I am a sinner. I own it. I confess it. You can even tell him what you, what God's revealing to you. Tell him. And right now, tell God, God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, shed his blood, so that my sins could not just be covered up, but they could be forgiven. And today, on this Sunday in June, Jesus, I bow my knee to you. I give you my life 100%. If that's you, you just make sure that God knows that right now. Clearly speak to him. Because he knows what's going on inside of you. Nobody else around you does. Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus, my Savior, my Redeemer, my ransom from heaven. I thank you that Jesus is the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. Not only my sin, but every sin of every person in this room, every person in Amador County, every person in California, in the United States, woo, in the world throughout centuries, Jesus has taken away their sins so that anyone could put their faith and trust in him and have their sins forgiven. Abba Father, I pray if there's anybody in here that you've been speaking to, that they would clearly bow their knee to Jesus today. We're so thankful. So many of us in this room have already bowed our knees to you, Jesus. We're children of the King. We're thankful that our eternity is secure. But we know people who don't know Jesus. Don't let us be ashamed. Don't let us be afraid. Don't let us be embarrassed. Let us share with them the penicillin that can change their life and change their eternity. Help us to be bold and strong and courageous. Abba Father, thank you for this great family. We have a great family here who loves each other. I pray that we will go farther and deeper in our walk with you, that we will love you more and more every day, and that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Give you our day today. We love you. Pray this in your powerful name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You guys have a powerful week, a great week. Stay strong in the Lord, the strength of his life, and never, never, never give up. Never give up. All right, you're dismissed. Have a great week.